Hello everyone, welcome to the video. I hope you're comfortable. If not, please get yourself into a nice, comfortable position and we can begin for today. If you're looking for a way to relax and learn something, then you are in the right place. Today we're going to discuss Sumerian religion. That's a religion that's been long, long forgotten along with much of the Sumerian culture. But the echoes of it still endure to our modern day. So, allow me to talk about it extensively today, and we can learn something together. So let us begin. Sumerian religion, practiced by the people of Sumer, the first literate civilization in ancient Mesopotamia was characterized by a deep connection between divinities and the natural social orders. Before the advent of kingship in Sumer, theocratic priests and religious officials effectively governed the smaller city-states. Though kings eventually took over, priests retained significant influence in Sumerian society. Initially, Sumerian temples were modest, one-room structures, sometimes elevated on platforms. As Sumerian civilization progressed, however, these temples evolved into what we know as ziggurats, tall, pyramid-shaped structures that featured sanctuaries at their summits. Several of these structures still remain in modern-day Iran and Iraq, definitely worth a look. Sumerians believed in a cosmogony involving cosmic births by gods. The primeval waters, Namu, gave birth to Ki, or Earth, and An, the sky. Ki and An, in turn, produced Enlil, who separated heaven from earth and claimed dominion over the earth. Humans were thought to be created by Anki or Enki, the son of An and Ki. So remember that Enki can also have the name Anki, so don't get confused. Heaven was reserved exclusively for deities in Sumerian belief. Upon death, regardless of their conduct in life, all mortal spirits were thought to descend from Kerr to Kerr, a cold, dark cavern deep beneath the earth, ruled by the goddess Ereshkigal. In Kerr, the only sustenance available was dry dust. In later times, Ereshkigal was believed to rule alongside her husband, Nurgal, the god of death. Key deities in the Sumerian pantheon included An, the god of the heavens, Enlil, god of wind and storm, Enki, god of water and human culture, Ninhrasag, goddess of fertility in the earth, Utu, god of the sun and justice, and Nana, the god of the moon. In the Akkadian Empire, Inanna, the goddess of sex, beauty, and warfare, gained widespread veneration across Sumer, featuring prominently in myths like her descent into the underworld. Sumerian religious beliefs left a lasting impact on later Mesopotamian cultures, influencing the mythologies and religions of the Hurrians, Akkadians, 
Babylonians, Assyrians, and other Middle Eastern groups. Comparative mythology scholars have identified parallels between the ancient Sumerian stories and those found in the early sections of the Hebrew Bible. Quite a coincidence. Now, let's understand some of the primary deities in greater detail. There are way too many to mention at the moment of all of the deities of the Sumerian pantheon. So let's get the four primary deities out of the way, some of which we've already briefly mentioned, along with what is known as the three sky gods. Then we will get to some more specifics of how Sumerian religion played out day to day. So we will begin first to talk about the deity Anu. Anu, originating from the Sumerian deity An, was the divine embodiment of the sky, reigning as the king of gods and serving as the ancestor to many ancient Mesopotamian deities. Associated with both divine and human kingship, Anu often occupied a passive role and was not frequently worshipped. Some suggest that the Eana Temple in Uruk, another Sumerian city that was quite large at the time, was initially dedicated to Anu rather than Inanna. However, the evidence for a change in the primary deity is lacking. What a shame that the divine embodiment of the sky did not get the credit that was deserved. How sad. Anu's spouse varied across traditions, with Ki, Urash, and Antu, at times equated with each other and all representing the earth, mirroring Anu's association with heaven. In an alternative tradition, the goddess Namu was considered Anu's wife. Anu is mentioned in the Epic of Gilgamesh, where his daughter Ishtar convinces him to release the Bull of Heaven to attack Gilgamesh resulting in the bull's death and Ishtar's humiliation. Another myth features Anu summoning the mortal hero Adapa for breaking the wing of the south wind, offering him the food and water of immortality, both of which gifts Adapa declines. In other myths, such as Hurrian myths, particularly in the Hittite translations about Kumabi, Anu was a former ruler of the gods, overthrown by Kumabi. This event involves the castration and the birth of the weather god Teshub, possibly inspiring the narrative of Oranos' castration in Hesod's Theogony. During the Hellenistic period, Hellenistic means Greek, if you don't know, the Greeks call their own country Hellas, Anu's potential identification with Zeus has been suggested, though this remains uncertain although we can certainly draw many parallels with the Greek pantheon and the Mesopotamian pantheon, that of the Old Testament, you will find that much of this rhymes and early human history tends to give quite a clue to where we got the ideas from. Anu, meaning sky in Sumerian, 
was the divine embodiment of the sky, as we've previously mentioned, and was of course acknowledged because of this as the supreme god in the Mesopotamian religion. Like so many other religions, when we look for the highest upon the high, the supremest being, we tend to look up at the sky, into the stars, the moon or the sun, uh, particularly the sun, as that is the engine in which life is brought to the earth. It seems to make sense. So his name is often written as Dan or Danum, reflected the numeral 60 associated with him. He was revered as the king of the gods, and who held an ambiguous and ill-defined nature, functioning more of a symbolic figurehead than an actively worshipped god. Despite his paramount position, Enlil, and later Marduk, played more influential roles in practice for the daily lives of people. Anu's role shifted, and only in Uruk, during the first millennium BCE, did theologians reinvent him as an active god. Astronomically, Anu governed the stars between Enlil and Ea's zones, known as the Ways. And in Seleucid times of Uruk, he was linked to the entire firmament. Seleucid times don't come until much later, as Seleucid times we're referring to around after the death of Alexander the Great, around 300 BCE. Anu's iconography lacked recognizable anthropomorphic features with references to him often including symbols of divine kingship, such as a scepter and a ring-shaped object. Depictions of Anu were rare, but his symbol, a horned crown on a pedestal, appeared on Kuduru and on Neo-Assyrian reliefs, much akin to symbols of Enlil and Assur. And speaking of Enlil, let us explain Enlil a little more. Also known as Elil, he is a Mesopotamian deity associated with the wind, the air, the earth, and the storms. Initially the chief deity in the Sumerian pantheon, Enlil gained worship among the various situations, civilizations rather, including the Akkadians, Babylonians, Assyrians, and the Hurrians. The central place of his veneration was the Ekur Temple in Nippur, a city believed to have been constructed by Enlil himself, symbolizing the mooring rope that connected the heavens and the earth. Enlil's prominence surged around the 24th century BC, with the ascendancy of Nippur, described as so holy that even other gods could not bear to gaze upon him. Enlil played a crucial role in many Sumerian myths. For example, the Sumerian creation myth. He separates heaven, An, from the earth, Ki, making the world habitable by humans, animals, and everything in between. Enlil is featured prominently in the Flood myths, rewarding Ziusudra with immortality in one version, and causing the deluge himself in another, as humans' noise disturbed his rest. Perhaps it was a Sunday morning. The myth of Enlil and Ninlil recounts Enlil's serial seduction of the goddess Ninlil, leading to the conception of the moon god, Nana, as well as the underworld deities Nurgle, Ninazu, and Enbilulu. Enlil is credited as the inventor of the mattock, 
and serves as the patron of agriculture. Several myths involve his son Ninurta, including tales like Anzu and the Tablet of Destinies, and Lugali. Despite his earlier eminence, Enlil's cult waned after Nippur's sack by the Elamites in 1230 BC, and he was eventually surpassed by the Babylonian god Marduk in Mesopotamian pantheon hierarchy. Enlil, the patron god of Nippur, was revered at the Ekur temple, symbolizing the connection between heaven and the earth. The Sumerians believed their existence served the gods, treating cult statues with reverence and offering constant care. Enlil received worship through food offerings and ritual feasts, and his priests had a great time attending to his statue's needs. Portrayed as benevolent, fatherly deity, Enlil was seen as glorious and essential for civilization. There is no Sumer without Enlil. Epithets like the Great Mountain and King of the Foreign Lands served even greater to highlight his grandeur. Enlil envisioned as a creator and supreme lord held titles such as Nunanmir and was referred to as the East Wind and North Wind. And because of this deep reverence that everybody had for him, kings did their best to emulate Enlil's just rule, traveling to Nippur for legitimacy. Even during the Babylonian period, kings sought recognition from Nippur. Enlil's prominence rose during the 24th century BC, aligning with the decline of An. He remained paramount throughout the Amorite period, however, yet waned after Hammurabi's conquest. That's Hammurabi of Babylon, the one who wrote Hammurabi's Code. The Babylonians worshipped Enlil as Elil, and during the Kassite period, Nippur gre briefly regained influence. Around 1300 BC, however, Enlil merged with the Assyrian god Assur, and once again gained prominence. In 1230 BC, the Elamite invasion led to Nippur's decline, and the new god Marduk eventually superseded Enlil as the head of the pantheon. Which means we arrive to Enki. Enki, the Sumerian god of water, knowledge, crafts, and creation, was later known as A in the Akkadian religion. Now that's spelt E-A, capital E, lowercase a. I do not know how to pronounce it, so please do some research of your own if you are that concerned with it. But from here we will refer to uh, the later name of Enki as A. Originally the patron god of Eridu, that was another city uh, around the same size as Uruk and Nippur, his influence spread across Mesopotamia, Canaanites, Hittites and Hurrian circles. Enki was associated with constellations like the stars of A and the field or the square of Pegasus. His numeric ideogram 40 became linked to him around the second millennium BC. So once again a lot more ancient numerology from the Sumerians as uh, they were quite keen on this practice. Enki's influence extended from southern Iraq to the Levantine coast, evident in cuneiform inscriptions from the 3rd millennium all the way to the Hellenistic period. His identification with the planet Mercury, later associated with Babylonian Nabu, 
persisted in Sumerian times. Myths about Enki abound, reflecting his enduring prominence in the religion's religious and cultural narratives. The primary temple dedicated to Enki was the A Abzu, meaning the Abzu Temple or House of Subterranean Waters, situated as a ziggurat temple in the Euphratean marshlands near the ancient Persian Gulf coastline at Eridu. This temple, known to be the first built in southern Iraq, dates back to over 6,500 years to the earliest Ubayyad period. Over the subsequent 4,500 years, the temple underwent 18 different expansions before being abandoned during the Persian period, as much of the old Bronze Age world was. Ninhursag. That's our next one. And this one's quite interesting. Also transcribed as Ninursag, Ninharsag, or Ninhursaga, and known by alternate names, Damgal Nuna or Ninma, Ninhursag was the ancient Sumerian mother goddess of the mountains and one of seven great deities of Sumer. In her earliest known role, she served as a nurturing and fertility goddess, often identified as the true and great Lady of Heaven. According to temple hymns, kings of Lagash were said to have been nourished by Ninhursag's milk, emphasizing their protective and nurturing qualities. Additionally, she held the position of a tutelary deity for various Sumerian leaders. Among her notable myths, the stories of Enki and Ninhursag depict her interactions with Enki, often stemming from his romantic pursuits. Another well-known myth is Enki and Ninma, a creation narrative where the two deities compete in crafting humans. Ninhursag also plays a role as the mother of Ninurta in the Anzu epic and is referenced in many other Sumerian myths. Ninhursag's role in Sumerian religion evolved over time, of course encompassing various functions reflected in numerous names, epithets, and worship areas associated with her cult. Initially found in smaller towns and villages, she may have been perceived more as a nurturing than a birth goddess. Some theories also suggest an early connection to the birth of animals alongside the goddess Nintur, her association with childbirth seems to have developed later, leading her to being hailed as the midwife who suckled by the kings of Lagash. During the third early dynastic period, Ninhursag's epithets increasingly emphasized her as the supreme mother of the world, transcending a purely biological motherhood concept. In the Neo-Sumerian period, she became more closely linked to the physical process of birth, as seen in offerings like umbilical cord cutters. While some propose a decline in her worship during the Babylonian period, others argue that her cult remained relevant, relevant undergoing a shift as she assumed the role of Belet Ili. Ninhursag played a documented role in the Sumerian kingship ideology, with votive gifts and dedications attesting to her significance. Beyond her connection to the mountains, she was seen as a personification of the earth, 
as evidenced in texts describing the season's creation through her union with Enlil. Associated with wild animals, and in particular deer, she appeared in the ritual incantations for diverse purposes, including protection from demons and assistance in childbirth. Additionally, her role in healing, reflected in medical texts, aligns with her nurturing aspects and echoes the myth of Enki and Ninhursak. And so those are the four main gods. And now we arrive to the three sky gods, that being Inanna, or Ishtar, Nana, also known as Sin, and Utu, also known as Shamash. And so for number one, let's first explain Inanna's role in the pantheon. She was the Mesopotamian goddess that embodied love, war, and fertility, with also deep associations to beauty, sex, divine law, and political power. Originally worshipped in Sumer, she was also known as Ishtar to the Akkadian Empire. You may remember the name Ishtar from the modern-day recreation of the ancient monument of, in uh, Iraq, the Ishtar Gates. She was also uh, important to the Babylonians, and the Assyrians, and many others around the Mesopotamian region. As the patron goddess of the Eana Temple in Uruk, Inanna's worship evolved in archaic Uruk, and she was venerated in three forms reflecting the phases of Venus. Key symbols included the lion and the eight-pointed star, and her husband was Dumuzid, with Nin Shubur as her sukal. From the Uruk period onward, Inanna's cult only kept growing and became widespread in the post-Sargonic era. Post-Sargonic era meaning the time after the death of Sargon of Akkad, the Akkadian conqueror. And if you are still listening at the moment, if you've not drifted off to sleep, I will remind you to like the video, comment your thoughts down below, and if you want more, perhaps you would consider subscribing. Let's continue. Her influence extended to the Assyrians, who elevated her above their national god Ashur. The cult persisted through the East Semitic-speaking peoples. Inanna left a mark on the Hebrew Bible, influenced goddesses like Ashtart and Astarte and possibly contributed to the development of Aphrodite in the Greek pantheon. Despite flourishing for centuries, her cult gradually declined, and between the 1st and 6th centuries CE, people gradually went over to Christianity, the new and cool religion. Inanna featured in numerous myths, often asserting dominance over other deities' domains. She received the Mez from Enki, representing all aspects of civilization, and took control of the Eana Temple from An, the Sky God. In enforcing divine justice with her twin brother Utu, she displayed her power punishing those who defied her authority. Her descent into the underworld, ruled by her sister Ereshkigal, is a famous myth where she faces judgment, but is rescued by Enki, marking the cycle of seasons with Dumzid's alternating presence in heaven and the underworld. Sin, or Sin, 
also held a significant role as the Sumerian moon god. The names Sin and Nana were used interchangeably, even combined into the double name Nana Suen or Nana Sin, not to be confused with Naram Sin, the ruler of the later times. Another name associated with him was Dilim Babar, represented by lunar logograms. He not only played an astral role, but was also linked with cattle herding and potentially served as a judge of the dead in the underworld. Distinct traditions depicted Sin as equal in status to the usual heads of the Mesopotamian pantheon, Enlil and Anu, or even as a king of the gods in his own right. However, this perspective had limited recognition. In Mesopotamian art, his symbol was the crescent, often seen in headwear or atop a staff, where anthropomorphically depicted. Boats were also associated with him, and many people prayed to him during their sea voyages. Ningal the goddess, was regarded as Sin's wife, and their notable children included Inanna, or Ishtar, and Utu, Shamash. Other deities, not like Ningul Blaga or Numushta, were also considered part of this divine family. Sin had an attendant deity, Alamus, and various courtiers like Ninyargara, Ninurima, and Nimintava. He was further connected with lunar gods such as Hurian Kusu and the Ugaritic Yarek. The primary cult center for Sin was Ur, where his temple Enkisnugal stood. From the early dynastic period, Ur was recognized as Sin's tutelary deity and divine ruler. The temple underwent multiple rebounds by various Mesopotamian rulers. Haran also became significant in the first millennium BCE as a center for Sin's worship, reflecting in Neo-Hittite, Neo-Assyrian and Neo-Babylonian sources. Sin's influence extended to other cities like Tutub, Babylon, Uruk, Nippur, and Assur, with his temple standing as testaments to his widespread veneration. The extent to which beliefs about Sin influenced to the Sabians of Haran, a religious community post-Muslim conquest, is still a matter of scholarly debate. And now we arrive at Shamash. Let's talk about Shamash then. We've mentioned his name a few times. He was also known as Utu, and he was the ancient Mesopotamian sun god, overseeing the world's events and ensuring justice and protection for travelers. As a divine judge, he could be associated with the underworld and was revered in the cities of Sipar and Larsa. The moon god Nana and Ningal were his parents, with his twin sister being Inanna Ishtar. Aya was his wife, and their daily reunions were believed to take place where the sun set. How very romantic. Utu had various siblings, including truth personified in Kitum, and dream deities like Mamu. His name was used logographically for foreign solar deities, notably the Hurian god Shimige. Although no specific myths focus on Utu, he frequently appears as an ally in the Sumerian and Akkadian compositions. Notably, 
He protected Dumuzi from underworld demons, assisted Gilgamesh in defeating Humbaba, aided Inanna in acquiring the Eana Temple, and offered guidance in the myth of how grain came to Sumer. Of course, worth a read, that one. I'll make a video on that later. He held a prominent position among the Mesopotamian deities as the sun god. His significance is evident in various god lists, where he ranks quite high. Revered as a god of justice, he was characterized by epithets such as youth and hero. His role extended beyond the celestial also. He was believed to traverse the sky daily in his solar chariot. The cosmic journey of Utu, depicted through sunrise and sunset, symbolized the movement of the sun through the cosmic gates, often drawn by equids or lions. Utu's association with dawn represented by his wife Aya, is described in texts portraying their daily reunions on a mountain where the sun was thought to set. Utu's role as a divine judge was also integral to Mesopotamian beliefs. His ability to witness all happenings on earth, coupled with collaboration with other judges like Ishtaran, contributed to his reputation for justice. The connection with the underworld emerged over time, influencing rituals and exorcisms, where Utu was invoked to guide the restless souls. Beyond this judicial role, Utu played a crucial part in divination, particularly in collaboration with the other deity Adad. Ritual texts highlight their responsibility for teaching divination to King Emneduranki, who subsequently disseminated this knowledge to the key Mesopotamian cities. Utu's multifaceted character underscores his profound impact on Mesopotamian religion and culture, combining cosmic significance, justice and divination in a complex web of beliefs and practices. The worship, practices and religious structure of ancient Sumer were deeply ingrained in the culture and worship of society in the city-states. Now here are some key aspects of the Sumerian worship. What was it like to go about your daily routines under the guidance of Sumerian religion. Well, let's have a look. Now, Sumerian myths were initially transmitted orally until the advent of writing. The earliest discovered myth, the Epic of Gilgamesh, is written in Sumerian on clay tablets. Early cuneiform, primarily a record-keeping tool, evolved into religious writings such as temple praise hymns and incantations called namsub. Architecture and Temple Development In the early stages, Sumerian temples were quite small, elevated one-room structures, but as civilization progressed, temples evolved with raised terraces and multiple rooms. Ziggurats, towering structures with stepped platforms, became the preferred temple style. Temples served as cultural, religious and political hubs until around 2500 BC, when political and military leadership shifted to separate palace complexes. Sumerian city-states operated under a virtually theocratic government before the emergence of the Lugal, or king, various N or NC, acting as high priests, controlled the cults of city gods. 
priests played a crucial role in maintaining cultural and religious traditions, acting as mediators between humans and cosmic forces. They resided within the temple complexes themselves, overseeing state matters, including the very important matter of irrigation processes. Some Sumerian cities experienced periods where their kings were worshipped as gods, much in the way of what was happening in Egypt at the time. Occasionally, this practice extended to encompass multiple cities in the region. But what about the ceremonial practices? Well, during the third dynasty of Ur, the city-state of Lagash boasted 62 lamentation priests, accompanied by 180 vocalists and instrumentalists, showcasing the elaborate ceremonial aspects of Sumerian worship. And with its rich mythology, distinctive architecture, and intricate priesthood, it laid the foundation for subsequent Mesopotamian cultures and influenced broader aspect of ancient Near Eastern belief systems themselves. The Sumerians envisioned the universe as a closed dome enveloping a primordial saltwater sea. This dome, overseen by the deity An, remember, her name An is uh, phenomenous with sky, enclosed a terrestrial earth, beneath which lay an underworld and a fresh water ocean called the Abzu. The earth was personified as Ki, initially considered an extension of the goddess Ki, but later evolving into the concept of Kur. The primordial saltwater sea, initially named Namu, became Tiamat during and after the Ur-3 period. But how did it all come about? Well, the Sumerians, like anybody else, has a creation myth. Everyone has to have one. And so the Sumerian creation myth primarily found in the prologue to the epic poem of Gilgamesh, Enkidu, and the Netherworld, recounts the origin of how our world came to be. Now, how did that happen? Well, initially, Namu, the primeval sea, gave birth to An, the sky, and Ki, the earth. Now, remember that word, primeval means it's been there forever, since time immemorial. An and Ki's union resulted in the birth of Enlil, the god of wind, rain, and storm. Enlil then separated from An and Ki, taking the earth as his domain, while An claimed the sky. In Mesopotamian belief, the sky comprised a series of domes covering the flat earth, often three, but sometimes seven. Each dome was crafted from a distinct precious stone, with the lowest dome housing the stars, the middle dome housing the igigi, and the outmost dome, personified as An, the god of the sky. Celestial bodies such as Venus, the Sun, and the Moon were also equated with specific deities, Inanna, Utu, and Nana, respectively. Heaven was solely the abode of the gods, and you weren't invited. Ordinary mortals were destined for the underworld, known as Kur or Ikala, after death. Well, it can't be all that bad, right? You've been a very good boy. How bad could the afterlife be? Well, unfortunately, the Sumerian afterlife was a somber realm situated deep beneath the earth, ruled by the cruel goddess Ereshkigal. Described in various sources as a dark cavern, Kur offered its inhabitants a shadowy continuation of earthly existence 
All souls, regardless of their actions in life, converged in this underworld, where they consumed only dry dust. Family members poured libations into the graves through clay pipes, allowing the dead to symbolically drink. Wealthy graves included treasures meant as offerings to Utu and Anunnaki, believed to garner special favors for that poor person stuck down in the underworld. Now, during the Third Dynasty of Ur, the treatment in souls of the afterlife was thought to hinge on burial practices. Sumptuous burials promised favorable treatment, while meager burials resulted in poorer conditions, potentially leading to haunting of the living by discontented spirits. Otherwise you'll be having some sleepless evenings. Now, how do you get into Kerr? Do you just float down there, or what? Well, actually, the entrance to Kerr, the underworld, was thought to be in the Zagros Mountains, guarded by seven gates. Neti, the gatekeeper, played a crucial role in guiding souls through these gates. Ereshkigal's messenger, Namdar, and a class of demons known as Gala resided in the underworld. Gala demons, often depicted as seven in number, were believed to drag unfortunate mortals back to Kerr. Numerous texts describe their involvement, including dragging of the god Dumuzid into the underworld. In later periods, the Akkadians referred to this realm as Irkala, and Ereshkigal's rulership was later transferred to Nurgle, the god of death. With attempts to reconcile their roles by making Nurgle Ereshkigal's husband. And before we finish up with the video, let's just quickly remind ourselves of some of the timelines we've been through. So, the early years of Sumerian civilization, it likely began around 4500 and 4000 BC. With our earliest historical dating records, going to around 2900 BC. The Sumerians, of course, practiced this polytheism that I've just explained, attributing anthropomorphic qualities to deities representing cosmic and terrestrial forces. The initial pantheon featured four primary deities, them being An, Enlil, Ninhursag, and Enki, often engaging in cooperative, creative activities. Now, around the time of the mid-third millennium BC, the area went through urbanizations and a somewhat of a change in the pantheon. It led to a transformation in Sumerian societies and the changes in the, some of the beliefs, changes in some names and gods not so much acting as kings of cities anymore. We had actual kings by then. That being said, each city's state had adopted their patron deity and prayed to it, believing them to protect and defend its interest although many of those deities lost their original associations with nature and rather were just simply associated with that city. And it brings us to the late 2000s BC, where the Akkadians conquered the Sumerians, syncretizing their gods with the Sumerian ones. Sumerian religion took on a Semitic coloration, with male deities gaining dominance. The original associations of gods with natural phenomena were lost, and a feudal society structure was imposed upon the divine pantheon. Deities like Enlil and Inanna were perceived as deriving their power from the chief god 
endless. And that's all we have time for today. I'd like to thank you for joining me on this long and very interesting journey into old Sumerian religion and that long forgotten, but as of the last one hour, slightly resurrected pantheon. I'm the ASMR historian. Now that we're acquainted, perhaps you'd like to hear more and subscribe. Do whatever you want. It's been a pleasure. Good night. Sweet dreams. <laughs>